Okay, hi. <laughs> um, first, I want to I want to say a really big thank you to obviously to Deirdre and Mother Voices. I feel like there's a lot of there's a great connection between what uh, Mother Voices does and what my project, Cultural Reproducers, does, and it's really amazing to be. Uh, meeting with uh, with people who have such a similar such similar ideas and, and spirit and have these conversations. So thank you very much, um, and thanks also to Lisa who connected everybody and, and made this an even richer conversation on many many levels. Um, so I'm Krista Donner. I'm going to talk a little bit about a project that I have been doing for the past two and a half years, I think, um, called Cultural Reproducers with a with a whole host of other parents in the arts. Um, but first, I have a question for you. And this is, um, yeah, <laughs> I'm not going to say anything about it. So how many of you, at some point, have received the message that if you're a woman, you'd have to choose between being a serious artist and raising a family? How many have heard that or felt that? Yeah. So a few of you. <laughs> right. Um, that's a sentiment, obviously, that's been passed along uh, loud and clear by many generations of mentors, gallerists, curators, and fellow artists, many of them also women. On the one hand, that always seemed kind of, um, before I had kids, seemed kind of antiquated and, you know, just old-fashioned. Um, we all know that this issue persists in other fields, the sciences, business, academia in general. But the art world's supposed to be so progressive and forward thinking, right? Like, how could that possibly be part of the art world? Um, I've always known that I wanted to be an artist, just as I've always known I wanted to raise a child someday. But I was nervous. I, I, as an art student, I wasn't seeing any models for this. Um, the only ones that I knew of, the only artists I knew of who were women who had also raised children when I was a student were Mary Kelly and Sally Mann. Uh, obviously, they're, they're also the most visible options out there that they've been making work about their about raising children for so long. So I was really, it's, it was hard for me to access the information um, about, about other women artists who, are, who had successful careers, whatever that might mean, who are also engaged in, in raising a family in some way. Um, and that's because historically women have, women artists have kept that information private for various reasons and I many of which I completely respect uh, and understand. They did not want to be defined by their motherhood. Their work didn't necessarily have anything to do with that. Um, but, the, but this lack of information really reinforced the idea that you can't do both, both for, for artists and art students, but also for the, the broader art community and those, and those people who are just like, you can't, you can't, you can't. Um, so let's see. There are obviously other reasons this stigma persists. Uh, it's not easy to be an artist or a mother, let alone both at the same time. Unlike other disciplines, work in the arts is often underpaid or unpaid, and it's unstructured, and it happens in between everyday life and paid work. So unlike something where you're going to an office every day, um, it can be really difficult to carve out those spaces uh, and prioritize a creative practice in a, in a different kind of way. Um, Obviously, there, there are these other challenges I'm not going to get into in detail, but time and focus, money, <laughs> identity, and the stigma in the reputational economy. And for me, I was expecting, I went into parenthood sort of knowing I was going to get less sleep. <laughs> it was going to be hard, you know, it would be hard to focus for a while. Money would be an issue. But I was really not uh, somehow prepared for the, the isolation that I would feel in the creative community. I didn't really understand why, why or how that would work. Um, so I think, it's, I think it's really ironic that while our children, especially in those early, early years, are going through these incredible developmental changes, that can be a really, really isolating time for especially new mothers. Uh, and they feel very cut off from their intellectual lives, their creative lives, um, and, and a sense of community. And part of that, I think, is, is due to the way that our institutions structure the possibility of participation. And that's something I'll get to in a minute. Um, so Cultural Reproducers is a project that, that aims to redefine and reconsider the role of, the, of artist parents in our culture. Uh, like a lot of projects, it started out as a conversation with a few friends. I mentioned them last night. My, um, 
my friend and collaborator, Selena Trepp, who's, a, who's an artist in Chicago, um, and uh, Lori Waxman, who is a, who's an art critic based in Chicago as well. We were having a lot of conversations. Our kids were about the same age, and we were just trying to negotiate all this. So um, the first thing that we did was we started having these small gatherings in our apartments, which were quite small. We were trying to, to use that as a chance to see each other and have these conversations, but also to network and do these things that we couldn't do because we couldn't get out to art openings in the evenings. Um, and having our kids there was really wonderful, but really distracting. It was difficult to have an actual conversation because we were so caught up in what our kids were doing and, and those kinds of things. Um, but some very important conversations started there um, at these small, small sort of meetings. Um, so in the meantime, I wanted to expand, I wanted to continue to expand the conversation, and I started a website um, that served a number of purposes for me, and this is still, it's still evolving as a project. Um, I wanted to bring visibility to cultural workers raising kids, so in terms of just having access to the information, I have, there's, someone mentioned the other day, there's, we have one um, post that's just this running list of very famous art, women artists who, many of whom a lot of us had no idea had children. <laughs> um, so, so just bringing visibility to, to the work that's being done and the, the, the idea of, that success is not necessarily um, connected in any way, you know, or limited in any way by having a family. Um, also to skill share, so to stop reinventing the wheel over and over again. Um, we we uh, started doing these interviews with artists from very very well known artists like Michelle Grabner, who curated the, who co-curated the Whitney Biennial this past time, um, to to much less known sort of emerging artists who are just really figuring it out with young like new new children, um, uh, and and so we're interviewing them about their work, but we're also asking questions about you know how how did you do it at the beginning? What you know what challenges did you find? What structural situations would you want to change? Um, and, and just having those conversations and putting it out there because everyone's dealing with it in a different way. And the more tools that we share, the more we can kind of configure our own ideal situation. Um, and the site is also a place where I, I collect a lot of resources, um, articles, residencies that allow families, um, books, so that there's a sort of a, a place where people can find a lot of resources that way. Um, and I used the space as kind of an online curatorial venue. Um, so I wanted to give access to, you know, bring visibility, as I mentioned, to artists from all over the world with no venue to pay for. <laughs> um, but I, I was interested in highlighting the work of a really diverse range of artists. So from those who are, who are making work very directly about parenthood, like Lenka Clayton, who I hope, if you don't know her work, you should look it up. It's really, really wonderful, um, really smart and witty. Um, having very much to do directly with, with the role of parenting to, as I mentioned, Michelle Grabner, um, who's also someone that Lisa mentioned, who's done really important work in uh, curatorial work, in running this gallery from her backyard and bringing the art world to her, but also has this um, really successful painting practice that is, that is you know, abstract, that exists in a different, different kind of way that's not directly about family life. Um, and I lost my place, sorry. Um, <laughs> so beyond the, the interviews that we do, um, another aspect of cultural reproducers um, online is uh, this section called residency report, which um, for me, I'm an artist that before I had children, I, I did a lot of artist residencies and that was an important part of my, my material practice was to go to these other places and respond to them. Um, and once I had a child, I started noticing that they all say, you know, this is not set up for um, artists with families. You may not bring your partner or children. Um, and that was, uh, that was very troubling to me. Um, it seemed like a very, you know, I understand from a practical standpoint why it might not work everywhere, but it also seemed like a really direct um, Block, right? A really direct barrier for those of us raising children to participate in the in the art world. Um, so, I was really interested in uh, including, yeah, my two 
close. Oh, not close enough. <laughs> I'm terrible with mics. Sorry. Thank you. Um, so I wanted a, a way to sh sort of share information about programs that do allow families and also to just see, again, a skill share, see how, how other artists do it. So we have a section called Residency Report where artists kind of write about their experiences. Um, while I was running this website, um, I was having these continuing conversations with Selena Trepp, this other artist, Selena Trepp, who's also a mother, about issues of institutional access. We were looking for ways to get involved in the broader cultural dialogue again, beyond just our group of, of mothers. Um, and so, obviously on a practical level, it's really difficult for artists with young children to participate in a typical art event because they're on Friday nights, um, far, from far from residential areas, in the middle of some dinner bedtime ritual that's <laughs> totally possible to disrupt, but frankly would have to be pretty amazing to make it worthwhile. So. Um, so we were thinking about those, those um, problems um, and, and also looking at existing family programming that's out there through museums and galleries. And uh, there is a lot of family programming, but, but family programming usually means kids programming that parents can come to, right? It's not, it's not anything that, that other adults would ever go to. Um, and so we were trying to think of what, what kind of programming could be engaging for adults, some of whom have kids. Um, and, and that way sort of integrate the community again so that they're not segregated into parents and non-parents. Um, so we put our ideas together, organized a budget, made these drawings of our dream, um, and got a project grant, to a very small project grant, to do a series of art events at venues throughout the city of Chicago, where I live. Um, and we had two goals. One was to, I don't think I have that slide anymore. <laughs> one, one was to, in, to really give access to the, the art community for artists raising kids, but also the other goal was to not keep doing this forever, but to provide a model for institutions to say, here's what we would like. We can make it work with a very small budget. Go, <laughs> right? So to provide a sort of a framework for that and put it out there and show that it can be done and work directly with those institutions and then put it on them to keep going. We'll see how that goes. Um, so these were artist talks, they were panel discussions, they were workshops, um, but all of them had these, these components. They were all on um, weekend mornings. So as I've mentioned before, Friday nights, not so good for many of us um, with small children. And also nap time is often a really, really important time for studio practice uh, for a lot of artists. And when your kids are asleep, it's really tough to leave the house. So that seemed like a really straightforward thing. We would just have these things in the morning. Um, but what we didn't realize initially was that almost all of the museums and galleries we were working with don't open until 11 o'clock, which is kind of when we wanted to wrap the things up. We wanted them to start at like 9.30 or 10, and then... Um, and then wrap up when the kids started to get tired and cranky and needed a nap. So we had to work with each one of these institutions, not just to have the event, but to open early for us. Um, and that really brought some interesting visibility just to the, um, that's, that's a structural problem, right? It's not so hard to have the staff come in a little earlier on weekends so that people have access to the museum then, but, but just bringing that issue up as an issue was an important part of the series. Um, the, another part was on-site childcare. So s since we had been having these meetings and we were, it was very difficult for us to like focus because our kids were in there with us, we wanted to bring our children with us, but we also wanted to have a place, if we wanted to, to, to for them to sort of play and have um, activities that were parallel to what we were doing. And then we could all meet back up with them at the end. But we were able to, if we wanted to, to focus without having someone pulling on our leg, we could do that. So we, had, we organized on-site child care. Um, it was often in a nearby classroom or a, um, some space nearby. And that was surprisingly really easy to pull off. We were worried about it, but it was fine. Um, and then that was followed up by all ages reception. So, that, so everyone, the artists presenting and the the parents and the kids would all be in the same space afterwards and meet each other and connect. Um, the cost was another important part of this. And a lot of the art spaces are free, not all of them, but we negotiated that with each, each venue. Um, but since artists are the most underpaid 
or unpaid workers in the arts economy. Um, it seemed really important for these to be free, especially because, as I mentioned last night at the reading, um, for, for parents, the equation of time equals money is really literal. Um, anything that you're doing uh, requires money for childcare. Any time that you're, you're doing something else, uh, you have to either think about the cost of childcare or the cost of childcare later when you are going to make that up in your studio time. So it was important to us that participants not pay a fee to attend um, or to use our on-site childcare. That had also had to be free. Um, but also that presenting artists had to be compensated for their time, um, which is apparently not a given. <laughs> um, so that was also worked into our, our budget. Um, while we were doing this series, Selena and I, um, I was approached to curate a show because institutions were getting more and more interested in these. When we started out the events, uh, we were really like kind of pushing it on institutions. And by the time we'd done our third one, institutions were, were really starting to approach us. Um, it was becoming kind of a, a diversity issue. Was, they were realizing, oh, this is going to look really good for our grants that we apply for, um, which is great, right? Um, so... So we were approached by um, Glass Curtain Gallery, which is connected with Columbia College in Chicago. Um, and another aspect of this is that a lot of, not just artists, but arts administrators are having kids as well. So the people running the gallery, Justin Witte and um, Nisa Page Lieberman, are both parents, and they were both really interested in having cultural reproducers curate something for the space, whatever we wanted. <laughs> um, so I paired up... I collaborated with an independent curator uh, named Thea Liberty Nichols, and we started thinking about an idea uh, that would be a show that's about parenthood, um, but not in, a, not in a really obvious way. We wanted something that would draw in a broader audience than, um, than would, you know, sometimes if you see work and you, know, you think you know what it's all about and you don't go look at it, um, we wanted to make a show that would draw people in um, and then reveal information as they went. So we were interested in that intersection between contemporary art and family life, um, but interested in doing it in kind of a, I don't know, off the beaten path kind of way. So uh, dealing with the work, dealing with the challenges of time, money, and, and also how parenting can benefit the work itself. Um, so I'm not going to show you everything in the show. If you're interested in the show, I will say there are a bunch of these catalogs over at the at print room that you can get for, I think, one euro. They're very cheap. Um, so if you're interested, those are available nearby. Um, but I'll talk just about a, a couple pieces in the show that I think kind of are good examples of this idea. Um, so Candida Alvarez is a, is a painter who's known for her really large, vibrant abstractions. Um, what a lot of people don't know is that when she, when she first had her child, and her kid is now, I don't know, he's out of college, uh, he's, he's fully grown, but when she first had her child and she was stuck in her apartment, she couldn't get out um, to the studio, she started making these small, small paintings on dinner napkins in her home. Um, and that is something that, and this is one of them, um, and that's a practice that has continued onward to, you know, for more than 20 years um, and, and continues to kind of uh, offer this other, this other sort of substrate for her practice and this other way of thinking in different scales uh, that informs the larger work but also exists in a different kind of way here. So again, work that's really directly affected. We'll see if this keeps playing. Um, that's Selena's work. I'm going to stop it right there. These are really lovely animations, but I can't get it to loop properly on the PowerPoint. Um, Selena Trapp, who's my collaborator for the events, um, deals really beautifully with uh, the limitations of parenthood and everything else um, as creative constraints for her work. So um, she was dealing with the, these really intermittent nap times that her, her daughter would take. That was her studio time. Um, so she started creating these nap animations that were um, done with her daughter's markers, and she would her, she'd put her daughter down for her nap, and then whatever that span of time was would be the span of time that she made these single frames for, for an animation. And when her daughter woke up, that would be the end of the animation. <laughs> um, so she would have, you know, it might be three drawings, it might be 25 drawings, it might be 50 drawings, it just depended on 
how long the nap was. Um, and these nap animations, again, not, not visually evident that they're about parenthood. It's in the, it's in the process of, the, of making the work. Um, and these usually, when they're not on my bad PowerPoint, these usually loop indefinitely on large screens that are propped up on rocks. They're really beautiful pieces. Um, it was also important for us to include men in the conversation for this show. Um, we wanted to normalize the idea that men can and should be active participants in the parenting process um, and recognize when it is. Um, this is work by Paul Nudd, who sometimes traces his children for these giant bacterial oozing figures that he makes. Um, and as we all know, there are, there are also some really complicated double standards um, of, in terms of content and critical success that happen when men deal with um, similar kinds of issues of the domestic space and, and family life. There are things that they can get away with that maybe mothers can't yet. Um, but for me, that was, a real, that was actually a really important reason to include them in, in, in the show and have, have men doing this kind of work alongside women doing this kind of work and really be able to talk about, oh, why, is, you know, why do you feel this way about this work and not this, um, and have them sort of right next to each other. Um, and we also just wanted to expand the dialogue, again, beyond, beyond the ghetto of just being an issue for women or for mothers to talk about. We wanted it to, to really show a, a broad um, array of things. This is work by Alberto Aguilar, um, who's, who does really wonderful work with his, with his children. He has four kids. And this is, um, this is not, actually not a piece in the show, but it's a piece I really like um, that's based on a game that he invented with his kids with these handbells and balloons batting them around and it becomes this really participatory um, activated space in the room. During that show, we were working, Selena and I, okay, Selena and I were working on our final event for the Child Care Supported Series. Um, we realized that if we kept providing child care, um, the onus would be on us. We would be sort of the art babysitters um, and not on institutions. So we, uh, for our final event as part of the Child Care Supported Series, um, we created this generative workshop to invite others in the community to work collectively to create the kind of community, creative community that we need. Um, we invited, it was open to the public, but we directly invited artist parents, art critics, administrators from residency programs and galleries throughout the city, many of whom had never met each other before. Um, and we sat down and brainstormed what it was that we needed and concrete steps to get there. So there were a lot of really great ideas that came out of it that we're still processing now. This just happened. Um, they included creative childcare co-ops and studio buildings with a room for on-site childcare and um, a certification process uh, or consulting for institutions. Um, and w one thing that we're already enacting is this ongoing series of intergenerational artist-run events throughout the city. Um, this conversation is still, still evolving very much, and we're, as we're continuing to rethink our roles as cultural reproducers, biological and otherwise, um, I'm going to close with an item from our manifesto that I, I read the whole thing last night, but I'm just going to read the last bullet point on that. Cultural reproducers is for anyone interested in making the art world a more interesting and inclusive place by supporting the work of parents in the arts. Instead of isolation, we seek networks of support, visibility, and dialogue. Working together to realize our collective needs and desires, we will expand the field to make possible new forms and ideas. Thanks. <laughs>